Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to uh, our second uh, CNN debate for Marketplace Middle East here at the Global Competitiveness Forum in the fifth year of its existence. Uh, when I see the, the title of our debate here, Capital Wanted, it's quite difficult not to hearken back to uh, the times of Jesse James in America, one of the outlaws of the most wanted, right? So you see the picture, the mugshot in the front, and the side mugshot of the most wanted individuals uh, around the world, the criminals that uh, need to be uh, taken in. And it's fair to say two years ago, going back to the worst of times in 2008, some of the bankers, none of which of course are on this panel, uh, became the target of the, some of the populist press as the most wanted individuals uh, in some of the cities because of the bonus structure, because of the collapse of the financial system, and that feeling we all know very, very well, even though it was only about two years and two months ago. And it's that I can describe as the frozen feeling when capital markets froze up, uh, when people didn't know if their bank accounts were safe, when the engines of commerce came to a grinding halt. So for the sake of our CNN debate today, uh, let's call the most wanted uh, the dollar sign, the euro sign, uh, in Victor's uh, spirit here, the renminbi sign, uh, the sign of the Saudi Riyal and the future currency of the Gulf. Most wanted is capital, the vital ingredient uh, to the global economy today. Uh, it's also worth noting for our purposes of the debate that we've seen a lot of capital flying into the global emerging markets. Uh, we see the headline numbers for foreign direct investment here at the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, better than $70 billion over the last two years. This is hungry capital looking for better returns but it always comes with the price tag afterwards, uh, a direct relationship between uh, risk and reward. That's the spirit of the debate here. I'm gonna try, if uh, time permits in our hour together, to open the floor to some questions. I ask when we do, because it is a TV debate, uh, that you identify yourself quickly and you direct your question very quickly to one of the panelists, and if that fosters another side of the debate, uh, terrific. It's great to be back in Riyadh where there's so much different activity uh, taking place. We have a, a star-studded uh, member, uh, members of our panel representing business from the United States, from Europe, from here in the Middle East, and stretching all the way uh, to China with Mr. Chu directly to my, uh, to my left. So we've got a phenomenal global presence on the panel. I'm going to call on John Frazier of, of UBS first uh, in, in the role of uh, establishing what I would say is the umbrella of this debate. And, and th there is a, a moral hazard here in a sense that many people think that the worst is over and that it's business as usual uh, and we don't need a whole lot of regulation to take us to the next stage. And there's a lot of differences within the panel if in fact that is the reality of today when we talk about capital wanted for the next generation of growth. John, do you want to take it from there? Okay, thanks very much. Well, you look at the past few years, and I think your comments uh, about maybe people think the worst is over, certainly the numbers could lead you to that con conclusion. The flows to emerging markets in 2010 recovered very, very dramatically. They were below the peaks that were reached in 2008, but the capital flows to those markets were greater than the period running into 2008. The nature of the investment has changed somewhat, far more deleveraged, which I personally think is a better thing, and very much focused on portfolio investment. To me, there's also another trend, a trend that I think will be sustained, which is going a tendency to go into real assets, to hard assets, infrastructure, transport, utilities. I think one of the outcomes of the global financial crisis has been perhaps a little bit of skepticism about the more traditional investment uh, vehicles. To me, the greater worry, the worry is about the future, the future where we have a massive amount of liquidity in the world with unresolved issues on regulation, unresolved issues on inflation. When those issues are resolved, I think we do run the risk of perhaps having a wall of investment hitting the emerging markets, and that could be a problem because at the moment the investment is focused on the listed equities area and that may lead to too buoyant a recovery. So I think this trend towards the harder assets may be helpful in attenuating or moderating those concerns. Great. 
Helmets, if I can have you bring the microphone a little bit closer to you there so we can hear you. Um, what do you see as the most critical inherent risk for 2011 looking at the capital flows that we see today? Well, I believe that what we need nowadays, and I'm, I'm saying that from my position as a private equity and venture capital investor, uh, investing in innovative businesses, uh, we need a slow recovery that is based on equity capital. I do believe that uh, we need to go through this process of slow deleveraging of the economy and of our businesses. And that is true for almost every industrial sector. And I, this is where I would put my emphasis and where I think governments, banks, and financing institutions should focus. Okay. Is there too much desire, Arif Nakfi, to try to take easy growth by funneling money into emerging markets in that if we sit down this time next year, we're going to say it was quite a painful correction because there was too much capital looking for this easy growth? I think, um, I think John, you've hit the nail on the head, actually, because uh, the way I see it, <clears throat> excuse me, the way I see it is that people are beginning to get back to some very misconceived and misplaced um, euphoria uh, around the state of the world economy today. I read reports from chief economists of leading banks around the world, and everybody talks about how um, global equity markets are going to do well, um, economies are going to do well, growth is coming back, etc. To me, I tend to think about life in a much more simplistic fashion without focusing on numbers. And I go back to the impact of human emotion. And what I mean by that is, if you think back to 2008, and it's probably more appropriate when we talk about capital flows um, to talk about life pre and post crisis. And I feel it's highly inappropriate at this moment where we are, where we don't know if we're out of the crisis. A lot of economists say we're out of it. I don't agree with them. When we compare pre and post, I'm faced with an environment where I look at life pre-crisis, I look at global capital flows in 2006 and 2007, and I see that as an aberration as well. Capital had become a commodity. Capital was no longer an allocatable resource. And what was happening was we had moved from developed markets to emerging markets to frontier markets. And money was a plenty. Everybody had it. And the way I look at it is, the pendulum had swung too far one way. Immediately after the crisis, it swung too far the other way. And as a result, we had a mismatch because human emotion had not yet come to terms with the just sheer seismic, cataclysmic shock that the system had gone through. Banking failures, systemic failures, and so on. Now, we've had 2010, two sovereign crises. What makes us think that Greece and Ireland are aberrations as well? What makes us think that those issues that gave rise to that are not going to happen again? What makes us think that the um, financial system, which was in dire need of a rectification of greed and a move towards resilience, has not yet properly been addressed? So I feel that the 2008 crisis was a crisis more of confidence but the impact of the reasons why it gave rise that crisis are yet to be felt, and we are now entering a period where we may yet have a crisis of consequence. And confidence and consequence are very different things. So am I feeling that ev the worst is over? No, not yet. But within that, when I look at my region, this part of the region where this conference is taking place, I feel that there are many, many seeds there for an optimism that is independent of the global economy, and I'm happy to talk about that when you wish. Thank you very much. Uh, Victor Chu, we saw China take the first step to remove the, the punch bowl from the party by raising interest rates. Uh, one eye on growth, the second eye on inflation. And in terms of emerging markets and the capital that's flown in, that has to be the greatest concern. Absolutely. I mean, the last quarter, China's GDP grew at 9.8% which is substantially higher uh, than what the Chinese government would ideally like to have. And so the brakes are being uh, put on. I mean, the good thing is this time around, China has a lot more um, market tools uh, to play with. It can use monetary tools uh, in, in addition to the traditional administrative orders. 
The other uh, area which is very exciting is the internationalization of the RMB. I think in the context of what we're talking about, I mean, the world is going to see the beginning of an extended period of increasing financing costs. Capital will be scarce worldwide. The new pocket coming out from China is the offshore RMB and also the possibility down the road of the institution and corporate investor through a pilot scheme in Shanghai called QFLP, channeling foreign currency, which the government will promise to switch in RMB to make the right investment. And long term, of course, is the Chinese uh, corporates and high net worth individuals being allowed through uh, initially a pilot scheme to channel their RMB into foreign currency to invest internationally. So the good thing is, on one hand, putting a break on domestic inflation, domestic uh, uh, asset uh, bubble. On the other hand, relaxing the RMB, hopefully allowing more you know, of the Chinese savings to support international economic recovery. Good. I'm going to come back to you on the internationalization and the influence of the RMB and that may have on uh, capital markets in general. Uh, we saw interest rates go up in China, uh, Cy Wagner, uh, to dampen inflation. If you look at Tunisia, you look at Algeria, you look at Egypt, you look at Yemen now also percolating, and even Jordan, which is a fairly stable government, the role of inflation and the role of the jobless uh, youth are the two key factors behind it here. So you have to get a, a handle on inflation to stabilize the Middle East, no doubt. That's very true, John. And I think what Arif mentioned earlier on confidence building, on venture capital and inward investment, as well as investment from the region, one of the most important constituents is instilling trust and confidence. And I think political instability is one of the biggest deterrents for inward flow of capital. And indeed, you'll have a negative flow because it'll be an outward flow of capital. So what's happening, what's happened in Tunisia and is happening in North Africa, particularly, for example, for inward investment in places like Egypt, where there is a dissipation of confidence and trust, Stepping out of this, we talk about the Middle East as one region generically, but, but obviously it, there are very different constituent parts. Where we are now is very different from North Africa, by way of example, and the region is very different than other emerging markets. The string that really links them all is in the importance of institution building. So in the importance of having, notwithstanding regimes, good, solid, independent judiciary, regulation, and I think if one can work over the next decade on doing this. In Asia, they're doing it well and more effectively in some places than others. In this region, I think they recognize the importance of institution building. And, and, and institution building is allowing them to be independent. And I think that is very important. Uh, when you touch on Tunisia and Egypt and Algeria in, in North Africa, there is a political dimension which does not exist in that way in this part of the world, where there is a greater degree of political stability. Okay. Because of the nature of this story and the fact that this story is unfolding as we witness online, as we witness on our television screens when we go back up into our hotel rooms, I think we should spend a, a little bit of time on the influence it's going to have on uh, the capital flows. First, uh, Ulf, I'd like to get your thoughts. You know, how do you see these events as an investor, this has been, the North Africa region has been a very high growth region. It's been able to attract capital in the past. How do you measure the risk reward ratio as a result of what we're seeing today? Yeah, it's, it's uh, I'm a little bit different on the panel as I'm an industrialist, a leader of a technology company. So I'm more the user of capital and relate to the world. We do uh, business in most countries in the world, excluding five. And I, I believe all of us want economic growth. Uh, innovation creates new products, improve productivity, it leads to economic growth. So uh, what is the capital market's role? To innovate, uh, like we all do, or support others to innovate in the value chain to, to create economic growth? And um, it's interesting to relate to the industry around capital. Is the business model is defined, I think, in three parts. They interact with each other to create the availability and allocation of capital, uh, to price for risk, the real risk, but also have the incentives. We have seen incentives maybe too volume focused, and maybe we will like to see tomorrow a transition more to value and uh, be responsible to risk. 
The issues I see, um, innovation is too low. Um, regulation and rules and behavior needs to support innovation. And, and in what context and what role do you take on innovation? The availability of, of capital and the risk assessment, I think uh, suppliers like us can be helpful in understanding and assessing risk so the cost of capital can be as low as possible. Also, customer and vendor financing. I think we as vendors and suppliers, uh, when we install and operate, can be quite helpful to government unders to facilitate financing. Also, I've seen the volatility, and uh, the volatility over the last two years on price and, and availability of capital. But in the end of the day, I think it's led us to diversification. Uh, diversification of lenders, diversification of type of financing, on exploration. But I must say at Inventors, um, it'd be quite interesting applying these points. Uh, we have grown in this recession our order book by twice. Emerging market can't have grown four and a half times. And, uh, and it's because we went into recession being debt free. And uh, by being debt free, we have not been distracted or limited in a way uh, that some others have and allowed us to grow. So I'm looking at an industry that needs to find its place. Is it about regulate, to control, or is it to promote innovation and make uh, capital more available and work harder for the growth of the economy? Okay. Arif, I'm going to follow up with you on this subject because it's an important subject. Uh, you've been an investor in North Africa and actually set up a fund to, small, uh, to fund small and medium-sized enterprises. So uh, you've been active in the MENA region going back better part of a decade, are trying to foster SME creation. When you see the activity we see, see today, when you see the protests taking place and it's spreading from market to market, what influence is this going to have on foreign direct investment and the willingness to fund new businesses? I think, John, first of all, I'll just take issue with one thing where you said the protests are spreading from market to market. I don't think they're spreading from market to market. Each market has its own issues. So we cannot, um, we cannot take um, rationale from what happened in Tunisia and think that it'll apply to Jordan at the same time. Every market has its own consequence. Now, the first thing we have to do is we have to stop and think, why are these protests taking place? Because we have a growing youth population. 50% of the population of this region is under the age of 21. Second, our educational systems are arguably inadequate to deal with the needs of the world of tomorrow. And thirdly, alongside the growth in the youth population, we have a growing unemployment problem. Now, what that means is not that people are inherently unhappy. What it means is that they need opportunity. So rather than looking at the negative side of it, let's foster the positive side of it and look to see how can we create those employment opportunities. Something like 78% of this region's population that is employed is employed in the SME sector. And yet, only about 26 to 28% of this region's GDP comes out of the SME sector. That's a massive mismatch. Because what we are seeing, therefore, is that big business dominates, and SME sector, which provides the inherent employment, is not yet taking its share of GDP. They should be 50-50. So I feel that the SME sector is a massive engine for growth, for employment, for taking away some of the imbalances that currently exist, and most important of all, taking advantage of something that we in the Arab world have not yet picked upon, which is that we are a region of 350 million people, number one. Number two, the only similarity that we actually have is language and we're not exploiting that properly enough. If economic barriers between the countries of the region come down, if businesses are allowed to trade across them, then I think the growth in employment, the growth in the creation of a single market of 350 million people is greater than the population of the United States of America. And that is a big market to exploit. So I think that you know the opportunity exists, it's just a question of how fast governance wakes up to the reality that there is many, many more, there are many, many more things to do and, and work hand in hand with the business sector.